everybody. Uh, it's Alex Grichuin, of course. Let me, uh, we're just doing some testing, but if, uh, if you have questions or anything in regards to pretty much, oh, All right, so if you have questions or anything that you want to relate to me, just comment in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer those types of questions. Um, anyways, uh, our live session will be at 10, uh, I'm sorry, at 11 o'clock for our Facebook Live. Good morning. What a portable nebulizer would you recommend for travel? So I, we don't have any necessarily any recommendations on um, on a on basically a nebulizer, you know, a nebulizer compressor, basically, so a portable one. So when we look at something portable, good morning. So if you look at something portable, you know, I always look at, is it creating enough aerosolization? So just because something aerosolizes, you wanna make sure, or you wanna just double check that the micron sizes are less than 10 microns, you know, that's being produced. Meaning, when I hold up my vial for my nebulizer, let's say I'm using a, a, a portable, um, I'm using a portable nebulizer, okay, that has its own little compressor, of course, because that's, that's the nebulizer compressor. Anyways, if I hold it up and I put some, uh, like, my medications in, or I just test it by putting some distilled water in, into the basin, if I see the droplets coming up, then that's a good micron size. If I see the droplets come out of this basin and go straight down, that means the micron sizes are too large. So it's all about like the impeding flow. Uh, you know, uh, it's so basically there's a constriction anywhere. So if you want to know if this is a good nebulizer compressor to use for your nebulizer and it's portable, just double check to make sure that first off the filters aren't blocked up and just double check to see if the micron, like the their, their aerosolization through the nebulizer, you know, when, the, when, the, when it humidifies, just make sure that it's, you know, it's fine mist, basically. And you see it coming up, okay, and not necessarily going everywhere else. Good morning, everybody. You've been posting and inviting people. Thank you, Rex. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about a few things. Of course, we're supposed to start at 11 o'clock, but might as well start right now. I don't see why why not. Um, so, uh, all right. First. All right. So demonstration of pursed lip breathing. Okay. That was, you're very welcome. Demonstration on pursed lip breathing. So when it comes to pursed lip breathing, the one thing that we have to understand is that Pressure is everything. Based off of Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, Gala Sachs' Law, even though Gala Sachs is actually uh, time, temperature, and pressure, but uh, basically high pressure follows low pressure. When people purse lip breathe, a lot of times they'll do something like this, okay, and they think they're purse lip breathing because according to some directions that are not very good directions, some directions just says, purse your lips as if you were going to whistle or kiss somebody. But how do you know that's good enough pressure? Because what is the actual action here? What's the point of purse lip breathing? Like, what's the point of breathing regularly versus purse lip breathing? Okay, so purse lip breathing forces oxygen into the blood faster than regular breathing. Regular breathing still gets out air, gets, gets oxygen in there, Purse lip breathing manipulates the air. Basically, it forces the oxygen past the semi-impermeable membrane, allowing gas exchange to be better or well, you know, uh, um, well enhanced in a sense, where gases can transport past those barriers. So, when it comes to purse lip breathing, you have to make sure that your purse lip is correct, like the pressure is correct. And what you would do is you would hold, even though this is a boldy piece of paper. You will hold a piece of tissue arm's length in front. And if you're able to move that vigorously, forcefully, then your purse lip breathing will work. Now, I see a lot of people trying to do something like this, which is not the correct way of doing it. You want to hold it arm's length in front, a piece of tissue. And then let's say I'm going to see if my purse lip breathing will work for me. Meaning I'm going to, like, uh, if I do this correctly, I know that oxygenation won't be that big of a problem, especially when I see my oxygen is low. I can bring it back up pretty easily. 
So anyways, I do this. And I see the paper, I, the tissue or the paper barely moves. And that personal lip breathing won't work. Even though I followed the correct guidelines, like I was going to whistle or kiss somebody, right? It might not be enough pressure. So I'm going to purse my lips a little bit tighter. And now I'm able to move that more forcefully. That's the pressure I want to remember when I want to purse lip breathe. So what's the point of purse lip breathing? Purse lip breathing works on oxygenation, okay? Doesn't work on necessarily out of breath because oxygen has nothing to do with out of breath, okay? Meaning low oxygen, high oxygen, nothing to do with being winded. For instance, you see an athlete, you see an athlete, and let's say after three minutes of exercise, enduring exercise, that person's oxygen is like 96 with their heart rate, it's like 140, okay? And, and mind you, 140, it all, it all depends on your maximum heart rate levels. So maximum heart rate is at 220 minus your age, and you want to stay from 40 to 80%. Uh, 80% with an RPE being 10, okay? And 40% with an RPE of, RPE stands for rate of perceived exertion. Uh, we look at it as, in pulmonary, we look at that as um, like your Borg scale, B-O-R-G. So the higher the perceived of exertion, the higher the work of breathing, okay? So RPE is from 10 to zero. 10 being not necessarily the worst, uh, but 10 being the highest, high end level of exercise, like I'm running or jogging, okay? While zero would be an RPE of zero or a one may, might be just me sitting up straight, okay? Where I'm barely gonna feel anything, okay? When somebody's working out, they want to stay at a four, five, and six on an RPE or board scale of four, five, and six, being able to still vocalize. So, anyways, you see an athlete that's going really fast. Their oxygen is really good, and you notice this, especially on the support groups. You notice this that a lot of people are like, "Alex, I'm so out of breath, but my oxygen looks good." It's like, well, yeah, because being out of breath has nothing to do with oxygen. If what you thought was true, then being out of breath, everybody has low oxygen, but that's not true because oxygen has nothing to do with being out of breath. It's the CO2. And how do you look at your CO2 in your body? Besides a blood gas draw, how would you look at CO2? Look at your heart rate, your pulse rate. The higher the pulse rate, the higher the CO2 levels. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see, I have been developing, let's see, I have developed this very dry cough I have tried a allergy pill, cough drops, please help, so annoying. All right, D, I'm gonna help you out with that. All right, so you developed a very dry cough. It looks like you're taking things like an allergy pill, cough drops, even possibly a cough suppressant. A lot of times these medications can dry you out. So the, anytime you have a lot of congestion and you're having a hard time bringing it out, is that the case? where you're coughing, you're feeling like it's coming up, but nothing is coming out necessarily. At least what it feels like, there's a gallon in you. It just feels like nothing else is coming out, okay? If that's the case, hey, Dr. Shaw, if you wanna come in when you're ready, we're just doing a quick Facebook Live on some of these questions, and YouTube and Twitter and Instagram and everything else, of course. Anyways, uh, Dr. Shaw just walked past me. Um, so a lot of these medications can dry you out. And if, if you feel like the congestion is, is coming up, but it's not coming out, that might be grade A inflammation. That might not be congestion at all. You see the loose tissues, the mast cells and globulate cells, anytime a tissue, uh, epithelial squamous epithelial tissue, the squamous epithelial tissue, that's the tissue inside your airways. So when they inflame, they fill up with fluid. And when that fluid is filled up, it feels just like congestion, even though it's the, it's the inflammation in the tissues that's inflamed, not, you know, it's not really congestion, it just, but it feels just like congestion, where I cough out <coughs> and nothing is coming out, but I feel like it's, it's trying to come out. Like I feel like, like it's coming up, but it's not coming out. That means that might be actually great any inflammation. That could be from mold exposure, allergies. It could be all sorts of things. So in that case, of course, the best thing that you could do 
I said, no, very dry, nothing comes out, the chest doesn't feel heavy. Okay, so on Okay, can you hear me okay now? I apologize, my uh, uh, my power switched over, so I apologize. Um, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me okay now? All right. There we go. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, with the amount of inflammation, um, you know, I would actually talk to your pulmonologist about certain medications that can help alleviate that but um, a lot of times if it if let's just pretend you have a lot of congestion inside of you okay and I'm not trying to scare anybody but if you have a lot of congestion inside of you and let's say you left it in there then it's kind of like I take a pen or a lot of people notice I have some tattoos so if I let's say I hit myself you know fairly hard at first I'm feeling it then after a while it gets very very numb Okay, where I'm not feeling it. Same thing with your airways. If you leave something that causes that glottic pharyngeal spasm, you're, you coughing, that's a glottic spasm. If you're coughing, but it, nothing is coming out, a lot of times the congestion inside of you can actually desensitize your airways where you feel nothing is inside of you. Okay, uh, If you're coughing, your body's basically communicating with you in a sense where Something's in there, it doesn't like it, and it's trying to get rid of it. If it's a dry cough, it might be from, you know, it could be from a scopolamine patch, it could be from a different type of medication. Uh, maybe even over the counter medications can actually do like cough suppressants, or even, which we don't ever recommend, cough suppressants, because your body's trying to get rid of whatever's inside of you. Um, but I would talk to your doctor about that because. Um, you let's say you you have a dry cough and nothing is coming out you don't feel anything it might be a desensitization issue it might be another issue but i would have to look at your medical history first to really determine what the problem is and then looking at which medications will work best for you because maybe one medication you're allergic to while the other medications you're not so i rather hit it where it counts i hope that i hope that uh um i hope you understand that okay so I, I, it's not like I don't want to give you a straight answer. I just want to make sure that you understand that everybody's different. Every person's body, some people are diabetic, some people are allergic to a lot of things, while some people are not allergic to everything. You're very welcome. Every time I blow my nose, it's always dry and bloody. Why is that? I'm on oxygen 24-7. Ah, easy fix there, easy fix. Okay, so there's something called a bubbler. When you're wearing oxygen 24-7, especially how many liters you're wearing. Anything above two liters per minute can sometimes, even less than that, can sometimes dry your nasal passages out. So you can do something where you have a neti pot or Neomed rinse kit. And actually, um, when you're using these, uh, you obviously don't use tap water, you use distilled water. And you put this little salt packet, you know which one I'm talking about? You put this little salt packet inside the bottle and then you shake it up and you put it on your nose so you're on seven liters. Okay, that makes sense. So basically your airways are drying out. A passover humidifier, like a bubbler, it's called a passover humidifier. So a bubbler is something you attach to your concentrator, your, where your oxygen is coming out, and it will, the, the air will actually pass through the, the water and basically grab some moisture from that water, called a bubbler, okay? I would ask your DME company to see if they have a different type of humidifier or a different type of bubbler. If you do, you have a bubbler. Uh, let's see, Fredoro. 
Fredora. I do apologize um, if I mis mispronounce your name, but do you have a bubbler? Because if you don't have a bubbler, then right there, that's the biggest problem, okay? I concentrated doesn't have that. Okay, because it, so you want to get a concentrator. All concentrators should have the, especially if it's going up above three to five liters per minute, they should always have an ability to attach a bubbler to it. How does your doctor know what inhalers are right for you? There are so many different inhalers. Yes, so a good doctor, uh, well, let me go back to uh, Fedora's. So Fedora, I would recommend talking to your DME company, okay, who delivers the oxygen to you or sets you up with your oxygen and just to talk to them about a bubbler. Okay, that will help alleviate a lot of things, but try a Neomed rinse kit. And maybe if this, if it's seven liters per minute, first off, if, it, if you're on seven liters per minute, you should be coming into this program. Okay, I'm not trying to sell you on this program, I'm just a clinician. But you should be going into at least a pulmonary rehab program that will set you up with everything and, and do everything for you. Uh, even though you have to be the one that exercises. But um, I would recommend joining a pulmonary rehab program, especially if you're on seven liters per minute. We can at least drop that down. You know, wean you down a lot, okay? Regardless of what anybody's have told you, if somebody says that you can't come off oxygen, you don't know what we can do then, okay? That's, that's all I have to say about that. All right, how does your doctor know what inhalers are right for you? There are so many different inhalers. So I found as a clinician that a lot of patients that came to us, that came to me, I uh, came, you know, went to Dr. Shaw, you know, for the first consultation and, and making sure that you're okay. Anyways, we found that I would say a roughly 80 to 90% of the patients that come to us, their medications didn't work for them. So it's not necessarily like your doctor's doing something wrong. It's what a doctor a lot of times will do is uh, they'll set you up with, let's say, this medication works best for this type of symptoms for this type of person. And this one, so they'll, they'll start out with like, let's say, you know, eight different medications at first, you know. And then after like about two, three months, they'll start titrating some of those medications that didn't work according to the side effects. They didn't work for you. So they'll start pulling some of those those medications out. What the doctor's actually doing is studying you, okay? It's not like it's a bad doctor that doesn't know what he or she is doing. He's studying you, finding out which medications are best, that work best for specifically you as a person, okay? There are a ton of medications, and what you really wanna look at is any dry powder inhalers, you wanna make sure your volume is good, meaning how much air can you bring into your lungs? Because if you breathe too shallow, sometimes that, those medications won't go deep enough into the lungs to make them work. All right. So like, for instance, not trying to name name brands or anything, but let's say you take a corticosteroid and you inhale that corticosteroid, but you're only breathing in about 250 to 500 milliliters. That might not even reach to the lungs at all. So it'll never meet that position of that medication. Meaning you take that medication, it does nothing. You know, it feels like it's doing nothing for you. That's because the volume is too low. You know, somebody should be breathing a little bit deeper than that. Uh, see, really, I'm grateful for these. We do not have this in my area. No problem at all, no problem at all. Fedora, my insurance denied it for the program. If your insurance denied it for the program, talk to your doctor about referring you into the program regardless of your insurance. So there are times where we would work with a doctor where they have a patient that, that, that doesn't, not trying to say you have bad insurance, by the way, but let's say that their insurance isn't the greatest. So the company, the billers, will actually work with you to help you, okay? But if we can help, and let's say we talk to your doctor, then we can work something out with your doctor where you can come into the program itself, okay? So don't worry, Fedora, but I would recommend calling us and, and having us at least talk to your doctor or you yourself can talk to your doctor about joining a pulmonary rehab program. Okay. Uh, see here. 
I have seen a few that came out of my oxygen in my group. Yes, on the bubblers. Uh, see, where to get more information about the program? So to get more information about the program, it's pretty simple, it's pretty easy. Uh, you just have to go to our website, and our website is homerehabnetwork.com. We're on a radio, we're on a lot of, like we have advertisements on the radio and everything in, in Maryland. Um, but uh, yeah, joining into the program, if you want to know anything about the program, yeah, please. If you don't know anything about the program, it'll, you know, you'll look at video testimonies, you'll look at all sorts of different things, but uh, it'll actually help you out quite a bit, especially giving you good information about the pulmonary rehab program. Here's Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw, did you want to take the seat? No, no, no. Are you sure? No, no, I'm good. I'm all right. <laughs> so right there, that's what they're oh, seeing okay, right now. Great, great. Okay. So, all right, Dr. Shaw, uh, somebody mentioned before that uh, that um, you know, there's so many different types of inhalers. How do you know which one's best for you? What would you say to something like that? All right, so that's a good question. Um, typically, uh, the steroid inhalers are um, more for asthmatics mm -hmm. or someone with COPD uh, overlap syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means they have a combination of asthma and um, COPD. Uh, the caveat is someone that has straight COPD and is on um, steroid uh, inhalers or a combination, uh, sometimes there's a susceptibility for pneumonia. Gotcha. Okay. And, and so it's not always the best. So typically if you're a straight COPD -er, um you want um, something like Anoro, which is a, a long-acting uh, albuterol type, what we call a beta agonist, yeah. uh, along with an anticholinergic like um, atrovent, but a longer acting. Gotcha. So they don't have steroids, uh, and that's really the uh, probably the the first line treatment, something like an, an anoro uh, type. That would be a maintenance medication. Uh, but um, there's nebulized forms now of all the different types of um, uh, inhalers. So if you can't generate enough, uh, you know, inspiratory force to get them in, that's another consideration of which is best for you. Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, the different types, then the steroid uh, combinations. Um, so there's, um, there's really just three types of inhalers. Gotcha. So you have steroid, you have, um, anticholinergic, and you have beta agonist. I think that that's, and then there's longer acting, shorter acting, that's a little bit different. Albuterol is a beta agonist, mm -hmm. uh, so it's a shorter acting, typically called a rescue inhaler. Uh, but um, outside of that, I, I don't think there's any other inhalers. Okay, okay. Um, but, um, you know, but, but each ha have a net form and an inhaler form, whereas in, in, in the, in the old days, which is like three or four years ago, you, did, you know, most of them w the, 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 were not typically in the um, net form. Uh, they were just in, you know, the longer acting ones anyway. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. shorter acting were always in kind of a net form sure. for, for a long time. Uh, but the longer acting recently, especially the anticholinergic, um, recently became, and I say recent, you know, relatively recent, like, yeah. I think three, four, maybe five years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, Upelry is that one. Gotcha. Okay. 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 Uh, but uh, you have to be careful about the pricing. The other, Yeah, that's the other thing. So people are not aware, and I want to make people aware. Um, Medicare Part B as in boy uh, covers nebulizer therapy. Medicare Part D as in dog covers the inhalers. Okay. All right. And the difference is that um, sometimes people can't afford their inhaler. Mm -hmm. But they may be able to get, because uh, Medicare B as in boy is part of durable medical equipment. Mm -hmm. So it may be an, a cheaper alternative. Um, just real quick, Sue, you said, wish they would take Medicaid. We too take Medicaid. Uh, we're approved through Medicaid. We just got that. Um, 
I'm not sure how long ago, like probably oh, just, just a few days ago. But, yeah, just a few um, days ago. That's Maryland Medicaid. Yeah, Maryland Medicaid. But yeah, I would actually call in and just double check to see because usually when one Medicaid in one state uh, does, you know, cover a program, you you know, usually. But mind you, I don't know all about billing. Okay, because you know, uh, you know, I'm I'm just a, a therapist, you know, respiratory therapist. So. I would recommend calling in and just double, like calling us, you know, by our, our phone number. That's the 410-871-4601. Just call in and just double check to see if your Medicaid will be covered, okay? Because I'm not sure if you're in Maryland or if you're in another state besides Maryland, you know, all, like all the insurances in other states, we they are covered, okay? Medicaid was the only tricky one. so. If you're covered under, let's say you have Medicaid, but you're in a different state, uh, sometimes, and I do mean sometimes, the Medicaid company in a different state will follow another Medicaid that was covered in a different state. I hope that makes sense. So I would say the best thing to do is call in first and just double check to see if can we accept your Medicaid now. Okay. Uh, replying to Sisha, I wish they would too. They only contact with... Maryland Medicaid at the moment. Yes, I was told that they're currently trying to. Yes, we are trying with other states with Medicaid. But, um, and the phone number, uh, Brittany put down a phone number. Uh, our phone number is the 410-871-4601. Uh, now, let's go over some of the other types of questions. Somebody was mentioning they have a dry cough. On a dry cough, they can't seem uh, to get any single thing out, but they keep coughing. What do you think that could be possibly uh, like? What what would that person should do? What I suggested they should call, talk to the doctor first and see if there's something different. What I went with uh, somebody also stated uh, on here about their uh, nose bleeds. Uh, they're on seven liters per minute. Ooh. Yeah, they're on seven liters per minute. And yeah. I was suggesting if you're on seven liters, I would recommend coming into the program because then you would be very yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. you would very uh, you would definitely yeah. get uh, benefit quite yeah. a bit Absolutely. if you're in this program. Um, and but, being, but, but but to that point, yeah. um, what I usually recommend for nosebleeds, um, one is you know make sure there's some humidity hooked up to your uh, oxygen, like a bubbler. A bubbler. Uh, the other is um, non-petroleum jelly that you could use a Q-tip. Uh, to kind of go in, into your nose uh, a few times uh, a, a day. And then uh, saline, um, uh, just regular saline. You could do that a few times a day. Uh, that seven liters is coming in at a pressure. Uh, it's, you're you're going to have, you know, those nosebleeds. But um, if you can kind of and make sure that uh, the cannula is not um, a little off because the more it's pointed towards the middle of your, or the, the, the inside, meaning the, the center, you know, like this way, um, that's where all the blood vessels are. And so you're gonna dry them out. The smaller ones, especially with pressure, if you're blowing your nose or coughing, are gonna burst and you're gonna get those nosebleeds. Mm. Uh, so th those are the things. The, the other question you, you uh, said before? Uh, the other question was uh, on a dry cough. Somebody oh, has right, a dry right, cough. Right, right, right and uh, can't seem to get anything right. out. So it doesn't feel anything. Okay, so, so you may not have any mucus. Mm -hmm. So dry cough can be uh, an allergic cough, can be dry, um, a reflux or heartburn issue, uh, can be dry cough, um, post nasal drip, can be a dry cough in the lung. Obviously it's not dry, uh, um, you know, coming from the back of the, 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 the nose and stuff. So, I mean, th there's, there's reasons for it. Um, so you wanna make sure that uh, the, these reasons are, are kind of accounted for, and then, you know, talk to your doctor. You know, all of this, talk to your doctor, right? Yes. Uh, but, but those are typically the, the reasons, reflux, allergic uh, uh, rhinitis, allergic sinusitis, uh, allergic bronchitis. Uh, these are all kind of giving a dry cough. Gotcha, gotcha. Great, great questions. Um, oh, this one's a, a uh, this is one I see often from Kathy. Uh, I don't seem to tolerate the steroid inhalers. They make my breathing worse. My, pulmon my pulmonologist is now trying Advair, but it's doing the same thing. My Pro Air helps through 
any thoughts on what to try on what to try yeah so uh, that's a small segment uh, of, of patients really uh, most patients don't have that issue as far as tolerability outside of I mean you're saying it's kind of making you worse but uh, typically um, a steroid inhaler you know, most of it ends up in, in your mouth and back of your throat. Mm -hmm. And only a small percentage actually goes through. And that also depends on the molecule. Uh, you know, each steroid is slightly different as, as far as size of molecule. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there used to be a very good one, Elvesco uh, was a very good one, a small uh, particle size would kind of get in better. Um, I'm not sure exactly what uh, is causing you not to feel good about having a steroid inhaler. Some people, like I said, it, it ends up in their throat, they get thrush, uh, or they get a sore throat, or they get um, uh, a hoarse voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very typical, but um, outside of not feeling well, that's something a little beyond that, I think. Um, so definitely check with your doctor uh, and, and see what he recommends. The Advir has a steroid in it, so maybe he's just trying different molecules of steroid. Mm -hmm. Maybe one would work better than the other. I know some people are allergic to or have a sensitivity to prednisone, but not to methylprednisone. Okay. Uh, which is solumedrol in the hospital. You might have heard of that. Uh, so there's a slight variance of the different steroid uh, makes a difference in some people too. Um, so it, he may be trying a different steroid uh, co uh, compound um, to, to see if you tolerate that. And if, if, if you can't, then, then you know, obviously you'd, you'd have to get off the, uh, the steroid, uh, uh, whether inhaler or oral. Um, and, and the issue with the inhaler mm -hmm. steroid, um, it's in micrograms, so it's like 10 to the six. It's, it's a very small amount, mm -hmm. but concentrated in your lungs. Whereas when you take a pill, like even if you're taking one milligram, uh, is a lot more and it's going systemically mm. whereas you know 200 micrograms right, right. Uh, is a lot less so uh, that has to that plays kind of a role as well so um, th and the reason that is also because you want it concentrated in the lungs you don't want to go into your eyes meaning giving you cataracts you don't want it to go into your bones giving you brittle bones or in your skin giving you brittle skin and you get uh, a lot of people get bruising um, it's because of steroids sometimes that can cause bruising, heartburn, reflux. Like it has all kinds of, uh, you know, bad side effects for, for long-term use. Uh, see, Mary asks, can uh, aspergillosis. aspergillosis go away on its own? Aspergillosis. So aspergillosis, um, so there's aspergilloma, there's aspergillosis, and then there's Invasive aspergillosis. I'm going to turn the, the radio on. There's uh, bronchopulmonary uh, aspergillosis. Uh, so there's different forms. So I'm not sure exactly which form you were referring to. Uh, but the invasive form definitely needs to be treated. Um, the uh, uh, ABPA, as some people call it, uh, needs to be treated. Um, typically, aspergillosis does not go away on its own and it definitely uh, should be looked at and treated uh, because um, uh, it can be a very um, kind of it can colonize it can stay in your system it can make you very sick or it can come in and out uh, and, and make you sick so you're saying ABPA so typically ABPA is treated uh, typically it it's uh, initially treated as asthma it's a type or a subtype of, of asthma, but, but it's, it, it becomes more severe. It doesn't get better. And then you have to get uh, on uh, systemic steroids and then maybe some antifungals. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it, it can cause some uh, um, scarring even in the lungs. So uh, it definitely needs to be uh, uh, treated. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. Now, let's see here. Or I have to speak up. Maybe I don't have a microphone. No, it's a... Uh, oh, I have to speak there. Yeah. Well, okay. you, you don't have to come up here. It's okay. actually really sensitive. So, oh, okay. So okay. you can... I'm not saying it's sensitive. <laughs> Just uh, it'll pick up your audio. Okay. You see, can Dr. Shaw speak up, please? Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. Oh, yeah, I had to... Uh, 
Yeah, I uh, I had to turn the radio up. down a little bit. Um, actually, I turned it off. But uh, anyways, we have a, a commercial on 100.7 The Bay, and uh, it's, um, you know, we're trying to basically gather as many people as we can to help those people out because the, I'm not sure if anybody knows there's a huge, not necessarily just a pandemic itself, but also there's a problem with hospital readmissions. So where a lot of rural hospitals, there's a big new, there was a big news report about it, where a lot of rural hospitals were shutting down because of the constant pe uh, people with chronic diseases, like chronic lung disease, uh, heart disease, all that jazz, um, are returning back to the hospital within 30 days once they're admitted into the hospital. So let's say somebody's admitted to the hospital and they get discharged. If they return back within 30 days, that hospital gets fined because that is so it's so insatiable right now where you're having people with covid that have other abnormalities that have a lot of uh, comorbidities and everything like that uh they're returning back to the hospital and it's it's becoming a big big problem so we're trying to pull in as many people here just because we have a 2.4 hospital uh, 2 2.4 percent hospital readmission rate which is the nation's lowest so literally anywhere around the whole United States, HRN has the lowest hospital readmission rates, which doctors absolutely love and the hospitals love. Uh, and of course, the insurance companies. So we're trying to pull in as many people to try to save them before they return back to the hospital. Because sometimes going back to the hospital is can lead to, can be sometimes if you wind up in a hospital, sometimes it could be a death sentence. Sometimes it could be, uh, you know, you, you can be get, uh, getting all sorts. There's a lot of complications involved, but um, it's, if your problem isn't resolved because, you know, you're, you're taking these medications, which I, feel, you know, which of course were pro medication, but um, exercise, you know, different types of exercises, especially, you know, intercostal diaphragmatic muscles uh, strengthening, is a different type of exercise than you, and you would never find that in a gym. That's why pulmonary rehab exists because we don't just look at that. We don't just do that. We do all sorts of things from stress management, vertigo training, uh, where somebody has vertigo, we'll help them with that. We have techniques with that. Uh, somebody has different types of problems that a gym couldn't help with. So that's why we're trying to get as many people as possible because we, um, first off, we get their life back, you know, at least that's what we strive for. And the second thing is, you know, you get your life back, you breathe better, you don't have to go back and forth to the hospital as much anymore. Uh, I believe one of our patients, I can't mention names because of HIPAA regulations. Um, I can mention first names. I can mention first names, right? Yeah. Yeah, Lucinda. Yeah. Yeah, it was a constant, was a person who was constantly being readmitted into the hospital like about three, four times a month. And uh, like per month, three, four times. She hasn't returned back to the hospital for an extremely long time. And when uh, her pulmonologist saw, and when we looked at the, looked at the data, we saw that, she, uh, that this patient didn't return back to the hospital for nearly a year when she was returning back three to four times. That's how well this program works, but the only way to really see it is, is to do the program. Actually, they said, we can't do anything further for you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just uh, absolutely ridiculous sometimes out there. But there is, I don't want to say there's hope. What I'm trying to say is that there is, we don't believe in hope. What we do believe in is either we do the exercises or we don't. You know, if we do it or we don't. It's There's no third direction, basically. So if you do the exercise, you're not going to hope you get better. It's just what's going to happen. You know, whether you like it or not, you're going to improve because we're going to make sure that you're going to get improvements and, you know, so we can send out, you know, reports out to you or reports out to your doctor, uh, letting you are, you know, letting you be fully well aware or as well as your doctor be well aware of, you know, any other types of complications. Maybe your doctor didn't know, or like maybe a medication didn't work for you. Maybe, um, Maybe you're trying to get off oxygen and we start trying to wean you, weaning you down, you know. So there, there's a lot of things in place. It's kind of hard to talk about this in, you know, in one hour. Uh, so the, the best advice that we could ever give you is, you know, join into the program itself. Let's see. Wow. Uh, who put that in place? The insurance companies? 
Um, I'm not sure, D. Um, I'm not sure what she means by that. I don't know. We're, we're, we're nobody owns us. We, you know, we're yeah. independent, so yeah. we're not part of the uh, insurance companies. Um, we just work with them. Uh, Rex was asking about the Encourage vest. It is a good vest uh, for what it's intended for to kind of shake you up and make the mucus kind of loose and, and get it out. So that was a good, uh, that's a good vest. Uh, you drink a lot of water, but uh, uh, your mouth is always dry. Uh, some of the inhalers mm -hmm. will do that, the Anticoalinergics, um, Spiriva, uh, Atrovent, uh, for sure, uh, have that as a side effect. Um, so. It, it may be medication, your other medications, blood pressure medication, mm -hmm. um, some of the diabetes. If your blood sugar is high, that can cause it. So there's a lot of other uh, reasons. Definitely get make sure you're hydrated, obviously, but um, th there may be medication uh, or some people just have dry mouth. Uh, so just make sure that um, you know your um, there's biotin, there's other things just just for the mouth. So um, if it's a medication issue, you get that checked out if it's a oral issue you know see your uh, uh, dentist about it is there Alex uh, what may I do with my husband's breathing machine nebulizer machine now that he has passed um, I'm not sure who you are I, I uh, um, it, could, it just says Facebook user on there um, um, but my our condolences on your husband passing uh, there are a lot of companies out there that would take a nebulizer, use nebulizer, and actually donate it. Um, if you wanted to do, oh, it's Ruth. Um, Ruth, if you wanted to donate it by sending it to us, we, we'll be happy to find somebody that might need a nebulizer machine or something. So uh, all you would have to do is just call us up and we'll, and we'll send something out to you, like a, or if you mail it out to us, basically. You're very welcome, very, very welcome. But uh, yeah, if you mail something like that out to us and we see somebody that uh, might need it, that actually legitimately needs something like that, uh, we can donate it to that person. So that's not a problem. We've done that in the past before as well. Um, our address is, um, I would recommend just calling us to get the address, but it's 11155 Red Run Boulevard, Suite 210 in Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. But uh, but no worries. And again, uh, our condolences. I know about about uh, your husband. I did hear about that. Um, okay. Uh, now, this was a report on the CDC. No, I'm sorry. I apologize. This was a report done um, about uh, using Listerine or mouthwash. Somebody was saying that you're more susceptible of getting sick in the morning than in the afternoon because a lot of times when you use mouthwash, uh, it will kill 99.9% .9 of all germs, not just the bad ones. And, uh, and then they were saying that, you know, they're trying to discontinue the alcohol type of, of mouthwashes because of the people that are immunocompromised using things that will kill all bacteria. And when you kill all bacteria in your mouth, um, those things protect you. So when you inhale something, its job, especially on the base of your tongue, uh, their job is to kill any invading particles that can potentially harm the body. What would you say to that? Do you, I, like we start hearing more and more and more about that. Like uh, the other time we heard about the hydrogen therapy. And then uh, I believe, um, Lori, you sent me uh, an email, which I looked at, and I did some research into it. Uh, but there's the only thing is that the peer review, there's not enough peer review for uh, us to make a, a good example of, you know, hey, that's a good thing to do. You know, a peer review is where you take a series of clinicians uh, with a group of volunteers, let's say, and then you test a hypothesis and you gather the evidence according to the hypothesis. The hypothesis could be something as, you know, does hydrogen therapy work for lung disease? Let's just say that's, that's the hypothesis. So we gather all that information, we'll test that amongst a large group of population of people and, and look at the data afterwards. Because the hydrogen therapy, um, we're talking about hydrogen peroxide, there's a lot of information out there, uh, but, because there's no peer review, we can't say it's good or not good. 
just because there's not enough evidence to show that. Okay, I hope that un I hope it uh, makes sense to everybody. Can you please explain how exactly to join the program? When in the hospital, I have excellent RT, but so sick I forget everything they told me. Yes, I cannot drive 30 minutes or more to a program. You this, shouldn't have to drive. No, you shouldn't have to drive no more at all. Driving. Yeah, there's there's no more driving now. Like we're we're the top elite ones, and we're we're uh, we're a virtual program. So to join our program, how this works is, you would call us up or make an appointment with us, and it's all done virtually. Meaning, if you have a smart device, you have the ability to to participate in our program, because we it works like a two way mirror where I see you, you see me, or you see Dr. Shaw, Dr. Shaw sees you, or vice versa, and with any clinician. Uh, telemedicine, basically. So we could, we call it telerehabilitation. Anyways, we'll, uh, you make an appointment, and then you see Dr. Shaw, and then the billing would take your insurance and verify, you know, insurance is, you know, uh, you're good to go with insurance-wise, and if there's anything that your insurance company needs, you will be well aware before you even start the program. So you have to, ex you know, you have to see everything your insurance will provide and what they will cover before you say yes or no. You know, it's just before you say yes, because we don't want anybody to be blindsided by, let's say somebody had a $10 copay, you know, or a $5 copay or something, and that happens because that's based off of what you set up with your insurance. That has nothing to do with us, you know. But um, we would, you know, let you know what, if there are any, uh, any charges or anything like that, and let you know well aware, you know, be well aware of any types of, co-pays or anything like that, which usually there's little to none. But anyways, once you talk to Dr. Shaw, your billing stuff is all done, uh, we'll send you out a kit. The kit will have like an incentive spirometer, a Delta V, a respiratory muscle trainer, uh, different types of things, a packet that you'll give to your doctor. And then we, uh, you go through orientation where you would learn how to use our system, basically how to use Zoom if you've never used Zoom before. Um, and uh, basically uh, getting to know your assigned clinician. So everybody gets their, uh, gets a assigned clinician, like I'm a lot of people's assigned clinician, where you would have my personal phone number um, and uh, you would work with me and I would work with you throughout the whole therapy program. The therapy program is, uh, the exercises are usually Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, we do have evening times available uh, for people that work and we we're very accommodating you know so if if you bring up and you communicate with us we can always like we have a lot of people that actually worked um while they were working we um uh, their employer actually allowed us to do therapy during their work time on their break and we we, we did it that way and uh, another person uh, can only do it after four o'clock you know so anyways you spend an hour and a half with us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you'll do exercises, respiratory muscle training, picking up your lung functions a little bit, um, learning how to breathe and walk. You'll learn roughly about 1,700 different types of exercises and techniques. We actually added that up to see how many techniques and exercises. So like a lot of times when somebody goes to the hospital, how much have you been educated on how to use your inhaler, your nebulizer, your how to breathe and walk, how to do this, how to do that, how to use a pulse oximeter, how to, you know, what's the best way to, how many of you have actually gone through that in a hospital? Barely anybody, okay? Because we worked in the hospitals. We, we, we know what happens, okay? In pulmonary rehab, it's very specific to pulmonary, meaning we're gonna teach you everything about different exercises, the routines of the exercises, how to stay safe, what to look for when you're going outside, what to do when situations get worse, um, all sorts of things to basically, we don't like to maintain somebody at the same level. What we like to do is a transformation. Okay, that's what we specialize in. Where somebody comes into a facility, let's say they come into a facility, not ours, but let's say they come into a facility and they feel the same exact way as they went in as they go out. That's called maintaining. What we like to do is bring somebody in that can't walk very far, and I don't want to say transform them, but it's, 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 it's the proper wording, where somebody can only walk five to 10 feet, and we get them up to about 200 first, then 300, 500, you know, 1,000, 2,000 feet, and then they're going miles, you know, after that. 
You're very welcome. They're very, very welcome. Do you uh, use exercise equipment? Yes, we do. Exercise equipment are very minor stuff. All we like, usually we can find anything in your home that you can use. Like for instance, if you don't have free weights, all we expect is free weights up to five pounds, nothing heavier. But if you don't have simple free weights, you can use soup cans, water bottles, anything like that will help. Uh, a bike, if you don't have a uh, small little stationary bike, they have the hand and foot bikes that are really inexpensive on Amazon. You can easily get for like $15, $20, you know, but uh, let's say you don't have that and you, let, let's just pretend you don't want to get one. That's fine. Then you're going to be doing leg flutters where we put weights on your knees and you're, you're at home in your chair and you would basically be lifting your legs up simulating a bike. We just need something that increases your heart rate by at least 10 beats. And then, of course, uh, our, um, you, know, you need a pulse oximeter. Uh, they have to be FDA approved, by the way. Pulse oximeter, uh, you'll get a monitoring device uh, to monitor you when you're not in therapy to keeping you safe. Um, but yeah, I mean, you go in, you, you finish out with everything you need to finish out with. Uh, but we base our success rates off of your goals as long as they're realistic. So uh, that's the program. You know, you'll do, uh, you'll go through a lot of education. You'll go through a lot of exercises. You'll learn all sorts of techniques. But basically, when you come into the program, make sure you understand that you should be expecting change in yourself, not staying the same. Because that's, it doesn't happen where somebody stays the same. You're going to improve. It's just what's going to happen. But we can talk all we want about it. The only way you can really know is if you try it. You know, there's nothing wrong with trying something first. Michelle Jones, I was only on auction at night before I went to the hospital in July. When I left, put on auction 24-7, asked my pulmonologist about coming off of oxygen. He said, never. So I was very de uh, depressed. I found this program, and I am going to get my life back. Thanks to you and your staff. Greatly appreciate it. Michelle, we love hearing stuff like that. Everybody, we love you guys. You know, but... Marianne. Yeah, Marianne. Oh, Marianne's awesome. <laughs> like, it's just... Everybody here is awesome, but, like, uh, uh, some of the things that people go through in their life, from what they could do before to what they can do now, just the transformation is just so amazing to see that. You know, but um, yeah, just if you're trying to get into the program, get into the program. Okay, uh, we have uh, there's no major wait time at all. Where a lot of uh, uh, facilities, yeah, there's like a wait time of I don't know how long. I don't know. It all depends, and then they they want you to wait. Why wait? I know you're you're going back and forth to the hospital. Why would you have to wait that Why long? Would you want to wait. And we found there was a one person that had to wait like six months before they can get into a Some program. People die waiting. Yeah, it, I it, mean, it, it makes no sense. No driving to our program. You do it at home. You can do it, you know, right away. There's mm -hmm. no wait time. Um, and the best therapy you're gonna get, the best advice, the <laughs> best education. I mean. Uh, it's, it's really, I mean, there was a study done on us uh, with Kevin Blyden over at Sinai, and it was a, um, what we call a white paper study. So they, uh, it's a studied paper where we, they look at statistics, they look at uh, out of a large group of people, and they tested us. And they saw that our hospital readmission rate was about 2.4%, while the national average averaged around 30%. 30%. That's a big number. You know, the, com the compliance rate are really low out there, you know, to a traditional 20, facility. It's yeah, like 20%. We're at 98 yeah. plus percent. Okay, so it's, you know, because you don't have to travel. You stay home, you do your therapy at home while you're live with us, you know, meaning that you don't have to come into our, even though we do have a physical spot in, in, our, in our building where you can come in, but basically you just, you stay at home and you do your therapy at home according to your schedule. That's it. You know, uh, you see us every other day and you'll spend an hour and a half with us until you're back to your old self again. You know, at least that's what we always strive for. And uh, we're pretty darn good at hitting the nail right on the head. But um, the only way to really find out more about us is you can research us. We're very, we've developed this program and we, I tell you, our reputation 
like we have achieved such a great reputation in the medical field that before when we first started this program, there was no program like this that existed. And then we started this before COVID happened. When COVID happened, nearly less than like 10% of all pulmonary and cardiac rehabs in the United States had to shut down. And what happened to those people? Those people had to go, they, they were left with nothing. You know, a lot of people went home not knowing what to do. Now they have an answer. Now there's a solution. It's like, why have to go anywhere where you can take us basically home with you? <laughs> you know, anywhere you like, if you have a smartphone, even if you're on vacation, you can still do therapy with us as long as there's a satellite in, in it in the area. You know, so yeah, there is no excuse. But um, I mean that with all respects, of course. You see, I am not short of breath in starting your program. Fantastic. Um, we always like to look at worst case scenarios, but uh, um, like on a six minute walk test, seeing how well you do off oxygen on a six minute walk test and, and other things. But um, I'm really glad that you love it. And see, I'm going through insurance changes and a colonoscopy on the 22nd. After that, I'm um, changed pulmonologist, then I am uh, try this, uh, do this program. Definitely try us, Rex. Yeah, Definitely Rex. Try us. No worries, Rex. We got your back on this one. Uh, this is all we ever do, you know. When I get anxious, my heart rate goes up and my oxygen drops down. How do we fix this? So, so we do stress management as well inside the program. So when you get anxious, let's say your brain, at any given time you take a breath, consumes about 30% of that oxygen in that one breath. When you're anxious, your brain might consume more, okay? Meaning you're out of breath just by overthinking. And you have to understand that CO2 is what causes the out of breath, but if one, oxygen, if one cup of oxygen comes in, one cup of CO2 would be produced. Okay, so the more an organ, like your brain or your heart or something else, the more it, oxygen it consumes, the more CO2 it's going to get off. Okay, and of course that wasn't true. You'd be blowing up like a balloon. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, so anxiety, you're going to have to focus on stress management. Um, just because the CO2 is being produced, heart rate's going up. You know, good way of looking at CO2 without a blood gas, just a just a kind of like a, a good guess is looking at your heart rate the higher heart rate the higher the co2 it's not usually always the case but usually it's a good way of looking at it if you have a very high heart rate you have a high co2 level you know but it, it doesn't mean that it's completely out of whack uh it all depends on your it depends on other factors of course should i uh wait august 1st pneumonia heart small heart attack two stents over three hospital admissions thank you no, definitely don't wait. The worst thing you could ever do is wait. Just start. Yeah, you want to just start because the um, thing that we've seen is that a lot of people have a lot of responsibilities. So they'll go home, try to focus on the responsibilities like paying bills, mowing the grass, doing something like around chores or uh, working on their family, let's say. Well, you're neglecting yourself because you're focusing on everybody else. When you're going to the hospital with pneumonia, you had a small heart attack, you have stents over three hospital, uh, three hospital readmissions, your body's talking to you. It's basically saying, I need help. We need help. You don't ever want to wait that. You never want to wait. You want to start as soon as these things happen. You want to start right away. Because the worst thing you do is wait too long, and then it ends up getting worse, worse, worse over in time. And then, of course, ends up in, unfortunately, death. So, um I hate to say it that way, but it is true. You know, I mean, it is 100% true. So yes, uh, we definitely would recommend actually joining the program as soon as you can. You know, it's a it's a, it's a certified program. It's a, it's an actual pulmonary rehab program. You're not going to go wrong. You know, we're all board certified clinicians. Um, it's, we'll be monitoring. Yeah, we're monitoring you everything throughout. Even when you're not in therapy, we're monitoring you. So it's, you know, it's a good idea to actually get in to the program itself. All right. Uh, any other questions? Please shout out some questions. You can bring up any types of questions. We only have a little bit left here. Okay. Let's see. Uh, is this program use Medicare? Yes, we definitely use Medicare. Yes, we d it's definitely covered by Medicare, yes. I have... 
I never heard of that. Just learning about you guys. We'll speak with my pulmonologist as soon as possible about this program. Thank you, Kathleen. We, 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 you know, that's really, really great because a lot of pulmonologists don't know that we exist. They don't know that there's another program out there that's a virtual program that is even more successful than going into a traditional facility. Uh, can you please explain My New Lungs? So My New Lungs is, if you go to MyNewLungs.com, it's a self-paced program. Basically, you work out with the, uh, the coaches, the clinicians, uh, or rather the coaches, and I give you program 10. <laughs> Laurie, we love you. Thank you for that. Uh, but the Mind Your Lungs basically is a self-paced program. You work the program out according to what you can do, and you just follow along. So as soon as you start the program, you'll start with week one, start with day one, week one, and you do one day per day. Don't ever, ever do two days in one day, okay? Each day consists of about 45 minutes on average. Uh, sometimes it could be less, sometimes it could be just a little bit more, but usually it's less than 45 minutes, but usually just look at 45 minutes per day. Um, and then you just uh, follow along. We have a lot of people that join the mindyoulungs.com side of it, which we usually use here uh, as, um, uh, um, as as a continuation of therapy. So let's say somebody jumped into and joined our program, we would share the Mind You Lungs for them to do something like what we call homework, uh, where you can do therapy. L Lori is putting up our website, uh, mindyoulungs.com. On the website. Thank Thanks, you, Lori. Lori. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm at 30%. Can I be helped? And how how long do I have to live? Long to, yeah. Oh, long. Yeah. Um, so, yes, of course you can be, Cheryl. Um, it does, like, we've taken people that had, like, 13% FEV1 slash FECs, uh, meaning they're, they have very end-stage COPD and they're still living today with a heightening of their lung functions. So we don't necessarily guarantee an increase in lung functions, but expect it to happen as we do bronchial hygiene, hyperinflation therapy, and different types of things like that to help open the lungs a little bit more, making them more compliant. And then of course you get a uh, better result with your pulmonary function test. Am I covered in New Jersey? You're covered in every single state in the United States. If you're in our, if you want to join our program, it doesn't matter what state you're in, you're covered. Okay, you are covered. You see, I'm on Trilogy. How do I know if it's getting into my lungs, Don? All right. Um, but first, the covered. So the covered means um, anyone can pay out of pocket. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, yep. But we do take major insurances, uh, Medicaid in Maryland. Uh, we're working on outside of Maryland, it seems like. Uh, but um, so the major insurance is yes, if you're going to go through insurance. Like commercial insurance is yes, yeah. no matter Medicare, what. Yes. We, we take. Yeah. Um, now, um, how do you know if the trilogy is working or not? Uh, meaning, it, how, how is it getting to my lungs or not? Um, I'd have to know your PFTs a little bit and how much inspiratory force you could do, but um, for the most part, yes, it's going to be getting into your lungs. Um, and you know, one one way to, to know is is it helping? Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, is it working? Is it? Do you feel anything? Do you feel any better? Um, I mean, it's a pretty simple, easy to use inhaler. It's one puff a day. That's it. Mm -hmm. So it, it it is pretty uh, pretty simple. Um, and and they've made it so the. The company that used to make Advir makes Trilogy. Advir was two puffs, meaning one puff twice a day. They made it even easier with one puff once a day. Mm -hmm. so, so in that sense, it's pretty easy. Um, and um, the way you take it, um, you don't have to really time it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that makes it easier uh, also. So now it's just a matter of can I generate that you know, deep breath in and, and get it in? And, and that's really where the question lies. And um, you know, you can't really assess that not knowing you, right? Um, yeah. So it, that's really where I think uh, the, the, the issue is. So I, I don't know, um, you know, how well you can breathe or how well you can take deep breaths. Um, join our program. Um, we'll help you with that. Um, but um, typically you will feel some improvement 
uh, and that will tell you that yes, you are getting it in. And, and um, in our program, we will teach you how to do the inhalers so you know the proper technique. So that's another way. Yeah. Gail asked, I am overweight. The, uh, that doesn't help breathing. Does your program address those issues? Yes, absolutely. Anybody with any types of problems with their uh, breathing, lungs, it could be from COVID, it could be from, you know, being overweight, it could be anything like that, we will address, of course, address that. Uh, Viola, this is a clinic. Um, it's a virtual program, but um, it's covered by insurance, but it's, uh, it's you know, we have to pay doctors and uh, respiratory, th they don't do it for free. So we, we uh, you know, we have to keep the roof over our heads and keep people alive. Um, but uh, if it was for free, then we would have to be non-paid as well. So yeah. I'm not sure where you got that information. Um, it's not free. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it's not free, but it's, it's a bargain. I mean, really. Yeah, I, I, mean, know, you, I mean, I, I don't know these days if you're going to get quality the, the way we have it, quantity the way we have it. Yeah, it's not like we're trying to sell this program. It's just that this is what it actually is. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and we, we just take insurance. Like, yeah, and uh, some people charge above the insurance. Some people take extra here, there. Some people are trying to sell you all kinds of things. We're just doing the rehab, and we're just taking the insurance. So, um, we're giving you our best. Yep, we're giving you the best. Uh, we're giving you your life back in, in many ways. Yeah. We're giving you ways to cope with your life. There's so many things that you, you just can't put a price on. But we're it, doing it at the bare minimum, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and like you, you want to also understand if there is actu an actual shot. Not, I mean, not, just put anything else to the side. If there was an actual shot of getting you better, not just a little bit, but seeing a significant improvement, wouldn't you take that? chance i mean it's not really a risk at all because i mean it's a covered program it's covered by insurance some people have pay it nothing out of pocket you know but it's if there was a if there was a chance of actually getting you better like le legitimately like where you get your life back you can go back to work if you wanted to you can walk further you can go longer you get your you know your your sanity back you know you're not so depressed anymore confident yeah confidence everything you, you're you're in a your your adls you know your adult daily livings your active daily livings are so much well improved why would you not want to do that i mean it would be different we talk 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 about it and our results show poor results but our results from everybody who has entered into the program, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, people that have entered into the program, to this date, we have the highest success rate in the nation, if not the world already, but we don't know the data on the other side, you know, on, on Europe and, and Asia and other, other parts of the world. But we know in the United States, that we are the best of the best, without a doubt. And people don't re uh, dispute that anymore because they saw the results. The clinicians don't dispute that anymore because there's evidence now. It would be different if there was no evidence, but, um, but yes. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, see, other than arterial oxygen test, is there any way to, way to measure CO2 retention? So usually a blood gas would be the best way of doing it. There is something called an end tidal CO2 monitor. It's called a capno check. Those are extremely expensive. Like a small, um, they call it a, a ResMed, I think makes them. It's a small capno check. It looks like the, it's the size of a pulse oximeter. It's about $2,000, just that small one. You know, some of those capno checks, the larger ones that we put on ventilators uh, to look at expired CO2. Um, those are like somewhere around well, they're, eight. They're really not available for yeah. public use. But um, the bicarb on your regular chemistry blood work uh, in chronic situations will be high uh, if you're retaining carbon dioxide. Yeah, he's talking about in the blood. There's uh, you know there there's different blood gases. So you have uh, the pH, which deciphers the the acidity level in your blood. Then you have the CO2 levels, which is around 35 to 45. pH is about 7.35 to 7.45. Oxygen is about 80 to 100. Bicarbonate is 20, 26 to 20, 22 to 26 moles per liter. 
and um, uh, and then you have the base axis. And so he's talking about the bicarbonate, the HCO negative three. So he's talking about the bicarbonate. If we looked at the bicarbonate, that you could actually see. And if the bicarbonate goes up, that means, and they're kind of, you know, they kind of work, they're relatable to each other, where CO2 goes up, bicarbonate goes up. CO2 goes down, bicarbonate, but the bicarbonate takes weeks for it to work. So if you have a heightening on your bicar bicarb in your blood, that means there's a chronic CO2 retention in a sense. Okay. Uh, is the CO2 reading on a... It's not on the CDC. No, it's not on the, uh, it's not on the CDC. Just curious, how long have you been doing the HRN? Uh, 2016, 2017? I think 2017 we started. 2017 we started in 2017. I resigned as a, uh, as a, um, as a director of pulmonary care at Future Care um, when Dr. Shaw and I, we kind of got fed up with people going back to the hospital but they insurance was coming cutting them out too early and they go home not ready and we were tired of that because these are people they're legitimate people that and there's good people out there and these people they just they go home not ready and they're not ready and you know they have all these you know i'm not trying to put facilities down i'm just trying to give you honesty here um from my experience and i'm pretty sure dr shaw would be related to that experience too but we didn't like that people were returning back to the hospital we didn't like that people were returning back home not ready and they were winding up dead or they just uh, winded back to the hospital again worse than before so we put a stop to that we established we designed this program to be a virtual program and we tested it first before we made it into uh, an actual company and uh, the program has just been taking off because it's just working dramatically well, just really dramatically well for people. And so we just kept it going. Uh, I'm with MGH in Boston, have been asking for a program like this. Well, tell them you got it. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell them you got it. T tell the whole hospital that, uh, you know, you, what they've been waiting for is right here. And you know what? It will be a good, good way is no matter what situation you're in right now, if you join the program and you went through the program, go back to the hospital after graduation and let them see the results because seeing it is the proof, you know, seeing it, not just talking about it. Um, but yes, just started your program and I think it's great. Thank you very much, Facebook user. Uh, so are you familiar with Zypher valves for emphysema? Yes, we work with a lot of, uh, we work with um, sp uh, like Pulmonox and, and uh, Innova, specifically Innova, um, and they refer us patients because one of the requirements for Zypher valves, you want to do pulmonary rehab before and after, um, and that's one of the requirements. So yes, we are very, very familiar with Zypher valves. My carbon dioxide on my chemistry blood work was 26. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah that's fine. That's fine. Michelle Jones. Just joined the program. I have been in it three weeks and can tell you a difference. You will not regret it. It's amazing. Thank you very much. Very, Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We work really hard. We just, you know, uh, I would hate to say that we're geeks in this thing, but we, <laughs> this is all we do. We love this. You know, I love being a nerd in, in chemistry and, and pulmon pulmonary stuff. So we love helping people. It's the thing is that, you know, the whole thing is about helping. Yeah. I mean, it's, it really is just seeing the, 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 you know, seeing the people when they come into what they transition after, like what happens after they, they graduate is just seeing them get their life back. We had somebody uh, do the, remember that? I put it, uh, that report on it because that, that uh, person was running the 5K, doing the 5K. Oh, it was yeah. one of our programs, and she actually uh, uh, did a 5K. That was amazing, you know, and, uh, yeah. No, Lori, you're awesome. You're awesome. We just we just work here. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop. No, don't stop. No, no, I'm joking. No. So, <laughs> um so all right how much time we got all right so we're kind of almost out of time here uh if you have a few more questions please uh go ahead and ask away we'll be glad to answer any types of questions and um we all uh we are going to be doing i'm not sure if we're doing it live uh first 
or I'm not sure, but we have um, some people coming in, like a dietitian, uh, to talk about dietary stuff. Uh, we're also going to be pulling in uh, some psychologists, uh, some other doctors, and things like that. So please stay tuned. Try following us on Twitter as well as YouTube, and um, you just have to subscribe, you know, uh, and uh, you can get those those videos when they come out. Uh, I know we, we have one this week with a doctor that we're going to be, um, Dr. Shaw is going to be talking about different various things. What what types of things are you guys going to talk about anyway? Well, he's a cardiologist. So oh, that's we'll perfect. A cardiologist. Love it. Cardiac issues related to lung issues. How many people will love that? Cardiologist. Huh? Give me a two thumbs up, two, two thumbs up emojis. I'm just joking. You don't have to do that. But, um, yeah, so we'll have a cardiologist, uh, and Dr. Shaw will be talking with a cardiologist about different topic, topics and uh, things relatable to the heart. Okay. Um, guys, that is it. That is it. I won't stop. I love it. See, I'm on Advantage program on Medicare. Give us a call. Yeah, then, Cheryl, give us a call. That's fine. How much will the upcoming – hold on. Oh, you, <laughs> you didn't have to give me a two thumbs up. I was about the holidays and how that would affect the, the rehab. Oh, that's actually, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, so, you're very welcome. So with the holidays, uh, we, uh, like for Thanksgiving, when is Thanksgiving? I forget. Next Thursday. It's next Thursday, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so th Thursday, it wouldn't really affect you, but if there any holidays that fall into therapy time we'll let you know ahead of time just letting you know that you know we won't be you know that we won't either be the doing therapy that day like sometimes the christmas or a, a major holiday that we have to take off on but uh, we'll let you know no worries thank you thank you thank you <laughs> you're very welcome laurie no 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 thank you I said, I'm going to Kentucky for Christmas. How can I keep the cold from affecting me? So you can do something where, uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that you could do. One thing, if it's really cold outside, you can do something where you put a scarf over your face, and as you breathe through it, it'll act as an HME, which is a heat and moisture exchanger. So as you breathe through, you should be breathing out vapor, right? You should water vapor. So that water vapor will wick through that scarf, and as you rebreathe it in, it will re-moisturize it, meaning the cold air won't affect you as much. It's not 100% relief, but it gives you a good amount of relief. Try that and see how that works. Also, if you're about to go out and you ex and you might feel that you might be, you know, potentially possibly wheezing, you know, in whatever you're going to be doing, try eating an apple 30 minutes, I mean, uh, 15 minutes before going outside and will reduce wheezing by 30%. Uh, try that, you know, and um, there's I nothing wrong with, yeah, take your inhaler with you, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have an inhaler, you can try the apple technique, but uh, yeah, try uh, bring an inhaler with you just in case. You see, you are about family, love seeing you and your son the other night. Oh, yeah. He was saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, really? Yeah, he just learned it. So, a small little kid, he was he was like, I pledge allegiance <laughs> to the flag. I, was like, I love that. It was so fun. He said, I had to share it with everybody because he's just so awesome. And Anyways, uh, thank you. Also, mom smokes in her house, but uh, not while I'm there. Can How can I prevent being affected by it um so what we usually would recommend is if you're in let's say in a specific room most of the time okay grabbing a uh it's it's a it's this it's this big room filter in a sense where it would take uh i forget what it's called it's a it's an air purifier mm -hmm. but it's a it's not necessarily a specific one but an air purifier will take any any of the smoke and try to, you know, not kill it, but, you know, isolate it or, you know, filter it through where you're only breathing in, uh, you know, good air and not, you know, secondhand smoke. So the, um, that's actually going to be also third hand smoke. So, you know, what third hand. No. So second hand is that they're smoking and that whatever's in the air. Yeah. You're breathing it in. Okay. That's second hand. Right. Third hand is 
those particles land on a surface. Oh, and yeah. And you're not touching I, it. And oh, that's, I didn't know that. So that's third hand. So that also affects you. So even though she's not smoking when you're, you're, you're not there, yeah. it's on the sofa, it's on the table, it's on the counter. So uh, that's third hand smoke. That is, I learned <laughs> something new. I love that. You see. Yes, that's what bothers me also. Uh, no worries, no worries. Just, uh, I always look at which room do you stay in the most, and that's where I would put an air purifier in. Uh, I hope that helps. The best thing that I can't, st <laughs> I can't uh, still smell it is, uh, yes. Um, but that it is the, probably the best thing to do. Usually if you, you know, if, I don't want to say, <laughs> I don't want to say something bad like, you know, if your mom still smokes, have her go shopping or something while the house gets cleaned up and so you don't smell it as much, but you know, oh, it's, it's only on visiting her. I got you. I got you. Uh, but, um, if you're in a specific room, the best thing you could do is just kind of let her know not to smoke around you. But, um, but you still had that. I'll try to get stuff. her into, you know, involved in some kind of a smoking cessation program. That's a great idea. Smoking cessation program, you know, um, you know, we do smoking cessations over here inside the program for people that still smoke. So it might actually be the, you know, uh, might be the fix that you need, actually. You know, at least what she needs. I think that would be a great idea. Um, anyways, guys, that is it. I hope you enjoy the show. Catch us next time. Uh, I don't see she don't smoke around. Oh, good, Lori. I, tr <laughs> I tried. Oh, believe me. Uh, no worries, Lori. No worries. Um, but catch us next time. Please follow us on YouTube and Twitter, and uh, we'll see you guys back back on uh, Tuesday. Uh, remember, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we we'll do our live uh, feed for about an hour, sometimes a little bit over. But um, but anyways. And I'll be on uh, in a few minutes. So. You'll be on in a few minutes. All right. See you guys. See you guys at 12. 12 o'clock. That is all.